43 through verse number 45. Amen. I want to say that anybody that if you have not come to a Thursday night for the last two weeks for our study on the book of Ephesians with Sister DeSico, you're really missing out with a lot of uh, good wisdom and a lot of uh, great points that are being brought out already. And I think not this Thursday because we'll be at camp, but next Thursday is one of the lessons that she's really excited about. Is that right? The next Thursday? She's shaking her head. No, but it is. Amen. So come on. Come this Thursday, too, if you're not at camp. And then Brother Alonso is going to be ministering. But uh, next Thursday, my wife will pick up her series again with Ephesians. And you're going to be blessed by it. It's also on the podcast. If you can make it, you can go on facmishawaka.org or the podcast. And you can check out the services that have been up there. Luke 6, beginning at verse number 43. Amen. The Bible says, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do gather figs, nor of bramble bush, 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 what's wrong with me? Gather they grapes. A good man out of good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And so I want to talk today just a little bit about a heart condition. A heart condition. And uh, I was going to do some demonstration this morning, and then I completely forgot until I got here, so uh, we're going to do some cool stuff and uh, mess that up this morning. Amen. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, but not speaking. The word abundance means a surplus. It means that in which one delights. The word heart in the Greek means cardia, which you know from, uh, if you've ever been in the medical field, cardia refers to your heart. And it also means our thoughts or feelings. In the Greek, it means the center and seat of spiritual life, the soul or mind, as it is the fountain and seat of the thoughts, our passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, and endeavors. It means the fountain and the seat of the thoughts, our passions, our desires, our appetites, affections, purposes, and endeavors. That covers a lot of things that has to do with our heart. And it says that a good man, in verse 45, out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man brings forth evil treasure. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Matthew chapter 12, you turn there and I'll get into what I'm going to talk about here today. Matthew 12, 34 through 37. Jesus said this, O generation of vipers, how can ye be evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, he repeats it, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, an evil man, evil things. But I say unto you, this is the different part, it says that Luke's account says one thing, Matthew's account adds this at the end of it. It says that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Why would Jesus, in Luke's account it doesn't say this, but in Matthew's account it says this, why would Jesus end this story with every idle word that men shall speak that we would give an account for in the day of judgment? Why would Jesus say that? He said that by our words that we shall be justified or that we would be condemned. The reason that we can be judged by our words is because our words reveal what is in our heart. Because what comes out of the heart or what comes out of the mouth is birthed inside of the heart. When you speak something, if evil comes out of your mouth, then you probably have evil inside of our heart. If negativity, hurtful words come out, then it reveals that you either have been hurt or maybe that you've lost faith in the person or in God. But what comes out of the mouth originates in the heart. So the question then is what do we allow into our hearts? What are we feeding our heart? Because remember, it's the soul or our mind. It's the fountain of the seat of our thoughts, our passions, our desires, our appetites, our affections, our purposes, in our endeavors. So what, what comes out of our mouths? If people follow us around 24-7 and they track what we 
talked about most throughout the day, what would they say is our number one desire? What would they say is our number one appetite? What would they say is our number one purpose, our number one endeavor? For some, maybe it's sports. For some, maybe it's the news or it's our job. For some, maybe it's family. For some, maybe, maybe we would show that it would be Jesus Christ. Because you've got to understand, Matthew 6, 21 says it this way. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The word treasure means the place in which good and precious things are collected and stored. You know, pirates go after treasures. Kings had treasure houses. That's where they kept their gold and their precious jewels. And anything that was of value to them, they kept it in the treasure house. So where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And so what comes out of our mouth says a lot about who we are as a person. It says a lot about what we love, what we spend our time doing, what we spend our time watching, what we spend our time listening to. For some with me, I've got this uncanny ability to remember a lot of sports facts. I don't know why it is, but uh, if you want to talk sports, I can go deep into the past with you. I can tell you, I don't know, it's weird who played for what team and almost the years that they played and, and uh, batting averages and home runs and scoring averages and basketball, football stuff, hockey, nobody cares about. Again, I know stuff about hockey. I have no idea why I know that stuff. I've got, I know things about golf. I know things about bowling. It's just weird, the stuff that can just funnel out of my mouth. Because growing up, I spent a lot of time playing sports. I spent a lot of time watching Sports Center. And if anybody's ever watched Sports Center, it used to be especially years ago. You know, they ran the exact same show. Anybody ever watched Sports Center, even recently or in the past? You watched Sports Center when I was, especially when I was at home sick during the week. Sports Center, they would play the exact same show from 9 o'clock until noon. It was the exact same. But yet, I would watch it from 9 o'clock until noon. The same rerun, I can tell you the next highlight that was coming up, I can tell you what happened. And then at the end, they'd start a new show, and they would take it for an hour, and then they would run that same show from like noon until 6. And 6 o'clock, they finally came out with a brand new sports center, and it was like, it was awesome. So I don't know, maybe it was years and years of watching sports center and playing sports and following Michael Jordan around. He was my basketball hero, and Jerry Rice is my football hero. You know, if anybody knows any of these names, they, they should. One's the greatest of all time in basketball. One's the greatest receiver of all time in San Francisco 49ers. They were the best team. Probably not anymore, but they were. And, and you could tell I knew I was in love with sports because that's what I would talk about with my friends. We went outside, we played sports all day. Everything had to be sports related. And even now as an adult, I, you know, catch sports center every once in a while. I'll, I'll listen to ESPN radio sometimes, and, and so I can still spit out a bunch of just random facts. But the thing is, that there needs to come a time, and with me, there came a time when I was about 15 or 16 years old that even though, yes, I was still heavily involved or heavily involved in sports, and I was still doing that and still watching sports center, but something else began to take over my mind. And something else began to take over my heart. And there's nothing wrong with watching sports. Center. There's nothing more wrong with listening to ESPN radio. But it became almost like a god to me. And I had to watch Sports Center. I had to see what was going on. I had to see who won and what happened in this game. And I had to know. I just had to know all of these things. But all of a sudden, when I was 15 years old, that I felt the Spirit of God begin to move upon me about ministry. And that one day I was going to pastor. And I can tell you where I was at church camp when I felt the call to preach. When they were singing a song at an altar call. They were singing that song, If You Can Use Anything, Lord, You Can Use Me. And I can remember being at that altar at church camp and, and just weeping and saying, God, I, I know that what I feel called to do. And God told me that I was going to pastor. It's one of the first times that I ever really heard the audible voice of God when he said, you're going to preach and you're going to pastor one day. It just, just, just touched me. And all of a sudden, my focus began to change. Not that I really ever slumped off when it came to church or to God. We, I was uh, active in our Bible quizzing every year from the time I think we were 9 or 10 years old. And so we would study and we had Bible quizzing every year. And I got the Word of God in my heart that way. I read the Bible at home. We were faithful in going to church. But my, my focus began to change. And when I began to study, my affections, yes, I still wanted to keep up with sports, but my affections began to change. My treasure began to change. I wasn't so active and I wasn't trying to be the 
best sports guy anymore. I wasn't trying to make sure that I had all the stats down and that I watched every second of every rerun of every sports center. And I wasn't always trying to hang out with all the friends sometimes. And I remember going to church camp when I was just, you know, 13, 14 years old. And, and Brother R.C. would remember that I had a spot by the lake, a little pond. And I would sit on this bench and I would just spend time and reflect. And church camp, yes, we goofed off, and yes, I played in basketball tournaments and, and all that stuff, but there was times when I would go off and, and be isolated by myself. We would get done with our youth service, and, and, and we would have a lunch it was at 3.30. Dinner was at 3.30, the worst time in the world to have dinner. Because by the time service started at 7, 7.30, and you're starving again. But, you know, we had, we had lunch at 3.30, and I would go to my spot by the pond and just begin to reflect on God and begin to reflect on what my calling was and what God would have me to do. What happens is we need to have a, a change in our heart because going through this world, there are things that are going to come on us. There are things that are going to try to weasel this way in. Things that are going to try to steal our attention. Things that are going to try to change our purpose, change our desires, change our, our affections. We've got to make sure that our treasure is in the right place. That our heart is in the right place. Amen. I don't want to have my heart set on worldly riches. And I don't want to have my heart set on getting the biggest house or the nicest cars. And, and I don't want to have my heart in all these material things. But where I want my heart to be is set on things above. Colossians chapter 3, 1 and 2 says it this way. That if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of this earth. The word affection means to exercise the mind, means to entertain or to interest yourself in, to direct one's mind to a thing. He says set your affections on things above. Exercise your mind on things above. Exercise your mind on spiritual principles. Exercise your mind on the character of God. Exercise your mind in getting into the Word of God and what pleases God. That's, that's what we need to exercise our mind in. I want to entertain myself in the Word of God and entertain myself in the presence and in the Spirit of God. I want people to know that not by proclaiming it through a microphone, but if anybody were to follow me, throughout my day, that my interest, I interest myself in the things that are from above, not on things of this earth, that I direct my mind to the things that are above, because the devil is very clever at stealing and killing and destroying. He's very clever at this word called distraction, and I believe that for the majority of us, it is our our desire to set our mind and our affection on things above. I believe that in this room, most of our mind, that, that's what we want. It's our heart's desire is to set our heart and our affections on things above. That we want to focus on God. And we want to focus on the kingdom. And we want to focus on winning souls. And we want to focus on spiritual authority and spiritual warfare. And we want to focus on prayer and fasting and reading the Bible. I wholeheartedly believe that. I believe that that is a part of who we are. And I believe that that is what your desire is. But just like what the devil wants to do is distract us from our purpose. Get us exercising our mind on our job. Because the boss busts in the door and says, hey, you're not doing this right. You're not doing that right. And you've got to work this day now. And I know you have Tuesday and Thursday off, but you've got to do this now. And he's going to use family against you. Your family gets torn apart and things happen and it distracts our mind from setting it on things above. There are, are things that go on emotionally. There are things that go on with your, with your, your marriage. Things that go on with your children that... The devil tries to distract us from things that are above. You might have a roof that begins to leak and your air conditioner goes out and it's a million degrees like today, high humidity. And you're thinking, I, my mind now is focused on the air conditioning. I'm focused on what I've got to do after church. And I'm focused on what's going on this week. And I'm focused on all the stuff that's on my plate. And I'm fo so our attention is no longer on the things of God. But now the devil has cleverly distracted us into, I've got to go here, and 
I've got to go there. I've got this meeting. I've got this to do with my job. And I've got this going on with the family. We've got this family function and this birthday to get to. And, and that and this and that. And the car breaks down and, and things. You know what I'm talking about. Life just begins to happen. And the enemy comes in and all of a sudden we've got to work another job. And all of a sudden we've got to do this. And all of a sudden I've got to cut out prayer time for this. We have got to set our affections on things above. That's why the Bible says take no thought for your life of what's going to happen. If he takes care of the sparrows, and if he feeds them, and if he takes care of all these things, remember that God knows the very number of hairs that are on your head. So we don't have to take any thought about our life because we can set our affections on things above. And when we do that, God will work it all out. But I want to exercise my mind. The problem with some people, and I'm not, is this is churches in general, just people in general, is that just like in the physical, when we exercise our body to it, all we exercise is our arms. And Brother Titus works out, you can tell, he's a he must know he's got it going on. If Brother Titus only worked out his arms, then we would realize his chest was probably suffering, his legs would begin to suffer, the back muscles and all these things might begin to suffer. And he'd walk in with bulging biceps and he'd have little chicken legs going on because he's not doing the presses, he's not doing the squats, he's not working out the legs. And so what I've been told working out is you've got to work out all of your body. Everything has got to work out. Spiritually, what we need to understand is we've got to exercise our mind on spiritual things, on spiritual principles. We can't get distracted focusing on things that are of this world because worldly things are temporary. But the things of God, they are eternal. The Bible says the grass withereth, the flower faded, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. And so if we can exercise our mind on things above, when we lay hands on the sick, they're going to recover because I've been exercising my mind. When we pray, things are going to happen because I'm exercising my mind. For some reason, we get this mentality that we can put junk into our mind and put junk into our spirit and then come into church and expect to exercise in the spirit the way that we want to and the way that we know we should operate. But God doesn't work that way. It'd be like pouring, I was going to do this, but it's like pouring a bottle of water into a glass that I have salt at the bottom. I was going to make somebody drink it and see what happened. But you pour water into a cup and you think everything's okay, but inside of the cup, if there's salt or if there's sugar that you really don't see, but it all gets mixed in with the water, it's either going to be really sweet or it's going to be really salty. And unless you've got a sore throat, you probably don't want a lot of salt water and you're getting in and swallowing that stuff. But that's what we do spiritually. Is we, we put salt, we put junk into our spirit, and then we think we can just come into the presence of God and operate and lay hands on the sick and do this and do that and have spiritual warfare and think that we are going to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. It doesn't work that way. But if we are exercising our spirit, if we are setting our affections on things above, if we're taking time in our day to pray, and to read the word of God, we're building some spiritual muscles, we're exercising, we're showing interest in it. And the more that you show interest in it, then the more God is going to pour into you. I show interest in spiritual warfare, that God's going to pour revelation about spiritual warfare. If I show interest in the fivefold ministry, God's going to pour revelation into it. When I was studying as a young person about the oneness of God, that was my affection. That, that consumed me. That's what interested me. And so now I've got a very good working knowledge of the oneness of God and the history of it and a lot of things because that was my obsession for a couple of years. I, everything I read had to do with oneness versus trinity and had to do with this and dissecting this and the history of that. That's what I set my affection on. And now I, I know that inside and out. If we can, as a body, set our affection on heavenly things, and if we can set our affection on the power of prayer, think of what we could do if we all understood and had our affections on the power of prayer. That when you pray, heavens can begin to open up and mountains begin to move. And when you lay hands on the sick, that, and that you can have hurt, the healing virtue of God literally flow through you and into the person that you are praying for, they can be healed and be delivered. If we can set our mind on those things, but in this world, we get distracted. In this world, we have things that get into our heart. Our heart conditions, even in the natural, can be affected by those that we hang around. Just 
like smoking cigarettes, you can cause harm to those who aren't smoking. Anybody ever heard of the term secondhand smoke? I grew up with my dad when he was alive, that dude was a smoker, man. I can't remember hardly a time where my dad did not have his cigarette or not. I mean, it was like one down, one gone. It was like lining up four, smoking them all at one time. Unless we got to wrestle with him every once in a while, you know, he would take the cigarette out and then he'd be winded. So I could probably beat him as a four-year-old. It was awesome. He couldn't breathe very well, but he was always smoking. And so we lived in a home of secondhand smoke until finally my mom said, look, if you're going to smoke, you got to go outside. you got to, you know, you're hurting the kids' lungs, you're hurting my lungs, you got to go outside and smoke. And so I remember my dad, I remember the walls being all yellow from the smoke. And they used to be white, they were, then they turned yellow. And my dad would have to go outside and... You know, they say you can do a lot of damage to a person, and it's almost even more harmful from what I've read to have secondhand smoke than it is to be the original smoker. Because if you're in an environment where someone's smoking, it's not wholesome, it's not, it, it can do damage to you. So just as that happens, being in an environment spiritually that isn't wholesome, it's not uplifting, encouraging, can be a detriment to our hearts. And so let me give you an example. When Israel was in the wilderness, the Lord would lead them by a pillar of cloud, right? A pillar of fire. If the cloud or the fire moved, then they would move. They would stay and Israel would stay. There were times in the journey that Israel didn't move for a while. And so what would happen is God gave Moses a specific way to camp around the tabernacle that they would erect. So they would build the tabernacle and obviously it was like a square or rectangle. So God set things up and had three tribes per side. Three to the north, three to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. And he grouped them together by different ranks. And in Numbers chapter number 2, 10 through 16, I'm not going to read it, but it talks about the second rank. And it talks about the people that were together. In that ranking, you'll find that the tribes, I'm going to mention two in particular, the tribe of Reuben, and the tribe of Gad were in the second ranking. And they were to dwell together. And so when they pitched their tents, they would be on that side that they were told, the north, south, east, to west. I believe they were on the south side. I could be wrong on that, but we're having a one in four shot, so just go with me on that. And so they would pitch their tents, they would stay there, and they would be on that side. When the tabernacle and the, the cloud would begin to move, they would pack up the tabernacle. And then they would go again by rank. So the rank one, they would go with the three tribes. Then the second rank, they would go with their three tribes. The third, their three tribes. The fourth, their three tribes. And so when you look at it together, the Bible says that they put Reuben and they put Gad together. Now we find that as they have journeyed for years and years together, let me give you just a little background over Gad and about Reuben. Gad was the warrior tribe. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 12 and verse 14, the Bible says that these were the sons of Gad, captains of the host. One of the least was over a hundred, and the greatest over a thousand. Another translation says it this way, you better understand it. These warriors from Gad were army commanders. The weakest could take a hundred regular troops, and the greatest could take on a thousand. So looking at the tribe of Gad, you took the dorkiest, the geekiest, the glasses, the suspenders, carrying the books, you know, the, the dorkiest, weepy, strongest, strangly little person. If you took them of the tribe of Gad, the weakest, they said, was worth a hundred regular men. And uh, uh, the strapping, muscular, that got all together, person from Gad, they could take over a thousand people out of themselves. So Gad, yeah, hangs out with Reuben. Gad, they're, they're the warrior people. They've got it going on. And so Gad hangs out with Reuben. Reuben was the eldest son of Jacob. When Jacob blessed Reuben, he said this. He said, you are what? Unstable as water. And he said, you will not excel. You're unstable as water. You will not excel. Basically telling Reuben, you're weak. And you're spineless. You're going to take the easy road. You don't like confrontation. You're just going to kind of go with the flow. You're not one to get into the battle. You're just going to hang back and let everybody else kind of do it all. If there's a time to fight Reuben, you're going to be the one that's not quite sure. You're going to hang in the back. And if the battle begins to go well, then 
I could see Reuben jumping in. And if the battle was going south, they were going to be the first ones to retreat. They just didn't have this warrior mentality. And so we would like to think that Gad hanging out with Reuben would have elevated Reuben. You would like to think that Gad, this warrior tribe, one, the weakest could take a hundred, the strongest could take a thousand. You would think that Reuben and Gad hanging together, that Gad would elevate Reuben and say, come on now, while, while Gad is doing their training, Reuben, come on, you've got to partake in this. I want to show you how to use a sword. I want to show you some tactical ways to get against the enemy. I want to show you how to fight. You would think that Reuben would have adopted their tenacity, their resolve, their fighting spirit. You would think that. You would hope that Gad would pull up Reuben, but the opposite is what happened. Instead of Gad pulling Reuben up to their level, Reuben pulled Gad down to their level. Gad's heart and affections were affected by Reuben, and instead of going out for war, they wanted to sit. In Numbers chapter 32, verses 6 through 7. Numbers 32, when you get there, they're getting ready to get to the promised land. And Reuben and Gad said, we're not going. We're going to stay on this side. Now, Gad was never a tribe to want to stay back. Gad is a warrior tribe. They're ready to go out and fight the battle. They're ready to knock some heads. They're ready to do this thing. But all these years of hanging out with Reuben, and all these years of hanging out and talking with them, begin to have a change in their heart. When they got to the Jordan, Reuben and Gad said, we want to stay here. We don't want to go over to the promised land, but I want to stay here. Our, our cattle, they've got grass here. They've got everything they need on this side. We have no reason to go to the other side. We have no reason to go over there and fight. Moses, in, in the beginning of the chapter, begins to talk to them about their requests and what it would mean and how their request would cause discouragement. Numbers 32 and 6 says, Moses said to the children of Gad, the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and you sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? He said, Why are you going to sit here? Because Gad, you let Reuben affect your heart. And now if you stay over here, now you're going to have a heart condition running throughout all the tribes. You're going to have discouragement running throughout all the tribes. You're going to have everybody questioning whether or not we can even take the land. Whether or not this is the land of milk and honey. Whether or not this is the land of promise that God had spoke to Moses all those years ago. They, if, Gad and Reuben, if you stay behind, you don't realize the effect that you're going to have. It's like a virus that goes through the body. Sometimes it harbors in one spot, but as one organ begins to fail, then other organs begin to fail. Reuben and Gad, if you stay over here, and if you cut out your fighting spirit now, I'm telling you that the, the virus is going to spread throughout the body, and if the virus spreads throughout the body, then there's going to be discouragement, and the mind's going to fail, and the liver's going to fail, and the spleen and the kidneys are going to fail, and pretty soon we are going to cease to exist. And so let me tell you here this morning that we've got to be careful of the environment that we put ourselves in. Because even though we can think in our minds that we are trying to elevate them, sometimes if we are not careful, those spirits can attach onto us and rather than lifting them up, we end up being pulled down. Discouragement begins to come in. And that feeling of we cannot make it, hopelessness begins to set in. And I tell you what, I don't want to have a feeling of hopelessness. I don't want to have a feeling of discouragement. But if God says it's time to fight, then I want my heart ready to fight. If God says to pray, I've got to have my heart ready to pray. I can't have my heart distracted on worldly things and distracted on what my environment says and what society says. I've got to have my affections on things above. And so God has given us a fighting spirit. God has given us the, uh, the armor of God. He's given us an opportunity to fight spiritual warfare. But I think too many end up hanging out with Reuben too long. Too many end up those that don't want to get into the fight. Those that don't want to pursue God. Those that don't want to pursue the promise. They're okay with almost making it to the promised land. They're okay with on the border or the threshold of the promised land. That's not what Moses' affection was set on. And that's not what Joshua's affection was set on. Their 
mission, their goal, their purpose, the thing that they thought about every single day. I believe in every night as a leader, they were there saying, God, how are we going to get to the promised land? How am I going to make sure we get there? How are we going to get through the serpents and through the scorpions? How are we going to get there? And so rather than, yeah, tell them Reuben, we can make it. Reuben was telling them, I don't, I don't know if we can make it. The weakest overcame the strongest. The condition got into them. And so what we need to do is look at our environment. Where are we putting ourselves spiritually? Who are we hanging out with even outside of church? Are they discouraging or are they encouraging? Are they speaking positive or are they speaking negative? What, what kind of environment are we allowing? Because one thing about negativity is negativity or the saying goes misery loves company. Misery loves company. They want to get there and misery wants to attach itself to every single person that it can. Misery wants to get a hold of Alante. And Alante it gets a hold of Dave. And Dave gets a hold of Flora. And it gets to Sister Adele. And it just goes all the way down. That's what misery loves to do. Misery loves company. And so we've got to understand that when those spirits begin to creep up and that we have got to stop them, we have to rebuke them in Jesus' name. Because what happens is this. When you get focused on discouragement, that's all you think about. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You can't see the blessing. You can't see the victory. You can't see the strength because all you're focusing is on the problem. All you're focusing is what's going wrong. Our affections are distracted. We're not focused on what we need to be focused on. That's, that's how clever the devil is. He's a sly old fox. I could catch him. I put him in a box, you know. And he's a, he's a sly old thing. He knows what can distract you. He knows what he can do to manipulate us to get our focus off of the mission and get it into the promised land. We've got to make sure that we recognize when discouragement comes in. And we recognize when those spirits come in. And we've got to stop them. We've got to pray. And we've got to get delivered right away. Because if not, it spreads to our minds. That discouragement. And that's all we think about. And then it doesn't just affect church, but it affects your family. It may ever been negative and then it affects your relationship with your wife. And it affects your relationship with your children. And it affects your relationship at your work. It affects your performance at your job. Because the negative, you can be just negative about your job. And it affects all aspects of your life. Because it's hard to just keep that at work. It's hard to say, okay, I'm walking out of the doors of work. I'm leaving the discouragement there. And there are times when I was in sales. And my wife would tell you, I would go sometimes long periods of time without making a sale. I'm stressed out of my mind. We've got bills to pay. We're trying to help support the church. You know, there's just a lot going on. We've got car payments, house payments. I like to keep her fed, you know, and, and trying to pay down some debt and all. You know, and you go a couple weeks, you're making sales. You go a couple weeks working commission and not making any money. I think it's just kind of weigh on you. And it affects your relationship. It affects coming to church because all I could think about was I've got to make a sale. Rather than coming in and praising and magnifying God, all I could think about was, okay, what are my appointments this week? How am I going to get a sale? What do I have to do? What, what should I be doing? It just consume my mind. And that is what I begin to set my affections on. That's where my treasure was. But then when I would wake up, as the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar just came to himself. When I had one of those moments in my own mind that I came to myself, and I said, what are you doing? If you can just set your focus on God and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all of these things would take care of itself. And I would have to refocus my mind and refocus on, you know what, God, stop this. Then everything would begin to work out all right. It's hard to just cut things off, but we've got to, we've got to do that. Have you ever said this or thought this? I don't know why I said this. You ever said, I don't know where that came from. You said something. So I don't even know where that came from. That's happened to me. Many of us have probably said that at some time. Something slips out of our mouth and you think you've never even said it. Maybe it's hurtful. Maybe demeaning. Maybe discouraging. When you say it, it's as if it came out of nowhere. But it doesn't just come out of nowhere. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. What was birthed in our heart comes out of our mouth. What's birthed in our heart comes out of our mouth. And sometimes we don't even realize what we're thinking about. We don't even realize the negativity that we give towards a person. We don't realize the feelings that we are harboring within ourselves. And so sometimes when all of a sudden something goes wrong or you're just 
maybe had a, a, something else go wrong in your life, or you're in a bad mood, and something just slips out. It doesn't just slip out. It's birthed in your heart. Maybe some unresolved thing. Maybe something somebody did to you. Something somebody said about you. If you don't correct it, then it stays in our heart. And things come out of our mouth that were birthed in our heart. And it's hurtful. And it can damage and ultimately destroy somebody. So we need to make sure that we check our heart. And we check our mind and say, God, what is going on? That's why David says, search me, O oh God, and know my thoughts. Try me and know my heart and see if there be any wickedness in me. David understood that if there's something going on inside of me, then it's eventually going to come out. And I don't want anything to come out that is not pleasing to you. Something that's not going to give you glory and give you honor. I don't want those coming out of my mouth. And so I've got to guard against what goes in my heart and what goes in my mind. The condition of our heart says a lot about you and a lot about what you think about yourself. Proverbs 23 and 7 says this, the first half of the verse. For as he thinketh in his heart, what? So is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How many of you think yourself a failure? Yeah. Let me raise my hand, but we've done it. I've done it. Think myself a failure. Think my fellow self that nobody cares about what I'm saying. Think myself the fact that why am I even in ministry? Have you ever thought about that? Let's just be honest here. Let's open the heart and let's have heart condition test. Have you ever felt like a failure? Think that I can't do this. Think that I'll never make it. I'll never amount to anything. I'll never overcome this, this trial or this test. I'm a failure. I stink. I'm worthless. I did a terrible job. Have you ever thought about those things before? Ever come into your mind before? Have you ever been in ministry? This is something ministry deals with a lot. And man, I'm sure Brother Spike, maybe if he admits it or not, if you get done leading worship service sometimes, it's like, man, I stuck it up today. Praise the Lord. I don't be playing the drums. I'm not tired, but I get done playing the drums. I mean, I stuck it up today. You know, I mess up. I have a tendency to lose a drumstick now and then. I stuck it up today. Sometimes I, I teach or I preach and I leave church and I feel so terrible about what just happened. Great move of God. And I'll go, I'll leave and say, I stink. I suck. I, I shouldn't even get behind a pulpit again. I can tell you that stuff that I've said. We're just being honest. And there are times that we have said things that I don't even know why I come to church. I don't know why I pray. I don't know why. Because I can't overcome this. I'll never amount to anything. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And when you think it in your heart, you hear it in your mind, and then you end up verbalizing it out of your mouth. And we've got to be careful what comes out of our mouth because it's either blessing or it's a curse. And we curse ourselves so bad of how terrible we are and how much we stink and how we should have done this and I'll never amount to anything. I'm a failure. I should quit going to church. Be careful what you're allowing into your heart. Be careful what you're allowing to sit there and how long you let it fester in your mind. How long you let it think. When you go to bed at night, if that's what you're thinking about, we've got problems. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you think about is I'm a failure, then we've got something wrong. Our heart isn't in the right place. Hey man, we've got to think ourselves a child of God. We've got to think ourselves that we are a vessel that God has chosen to use in whatever capacity He has chosen to use us. We've got to stop thinking it's about us and realize that it's about Him. And that it's not us doing the work, but that it's God doing the work. We have got to think ourselves that we are more than conquerors and that I am an overcomer. That I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. Those are things that we need to be thinking about. But we let the devil into our mind say, you're worthless. Your family is never going to be saved. Your loved ones are never going to be saved. This will never work out. They're hopeless. And then you know what we say? Hopeless. We say they'll never hunt him before. We say blah 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 blah. They don't mind. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Stop thinking yourself defeated. Stop telling yourself you're worthless. Stop telling yourself you'll never amount to anything. Stop telling yourself you're a failure because you are the apple of Jesus' eye. If his eye is on the spare, he knows the very number of hairs that are on your head. If he feeds the birds, and if you close the, the grass with all these flowers, how much more does he think about you? How much more does he think about you? And so think yourself, I'm a child of God. I am powerful because I've got the Holy Ghost. Don't get prideful and arrogant yourself because it's not about us, but you are powerful in the Holy Ghost. You are powerful because you have the Spirit of God living in
inside of you. And you've got to stop telling yourself, I'll never get this. This will never happen. I'll never, this will, the church will never. Stop saying that will never. I'll never. Love. You've got to start saying, I'll tell you, we are victorious. I am. I am. I am. I am. I want to talk just a minute. I know I'm going to have to rush through this very quickly. David had a heart condition. We think of David being a, a great man, and he was a very great man of God. But I'll tell you what, David had a heart condition. We find that in First or Second Samuel 11, that David was supposed to go to war. I'm going to give you a very quick clip of version. David was supposed to go to war. And then he says he stayed behind. The time that the kings would go to war, he stays behind, finds himself on the roof. What does he find on the roof? Bathsheba. What is she doing? She's taking her back. She's up there naked. She's taking her back. Now let me just give you the male's perspective. Man's on the roof. Sees a naked lady. He's not going to turn his eyes. I'm just going to be real. He's not going to turn his eyes. That's what men do. We're, we're, we're driven by visual. It's what guys are. Women are more emotional. Men are driven by visual stimulation. So there, he looks and he sees this woman. He gets to lust over her. He begins to inquire, the Bible says, about this woman. His advisors say, this is the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. The Bible says that David then sends messengers and takes her and comes in unto her and lays with her. Now I want you to just take a step back for a moment. David saw Bathsheba on the top of the roof. She's a beautiful woman. He inquires of her. He begins to tell, people begin to tell the king that she's the wife of Uriah. The Bible does not say how long it took him to send the messengers. It just says, she's the wife of Uriah. Next verse says, he sent for her. Now, he could have sent for her immediately, knowing that he was the wife, but she could have just said, I don't care, go get her and bring her over here. I don't tend to believe that. In my mind, knowing the character of the heart of David, in my mind, David appears. Now, just take go with me. I'm not saying this Bible is bad, but just go with me in my mind here. In my mind, this is what David says. It's the wife, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. It's his wife. So he begins to distract himself with other things. He tries to hang out with his other children. He tries to talk to his other wives. He tries to find out how the battles are going. He's trying to distract himself from what he saw and the visual image that is now burned into his brain. He's trying to get it out, so he's distracting himself. And so I believe that it wasn't just an immediate thing, but David's going through it. He's trying to occupy his mind with something else. He's trying to do other things, distract himself. But even though he tries to distract himself, there's something that was burned into his brain. There's an image that he could not overcome. And he finally says he gave in to his lust. He gave in to then what was burning inside of his heart. I believe that while David, maybe while he was trying to play with his kids, he was still thinking about it. While he was still trying to find out what was going on in the war, he was still thinking about her. He couldn't get Bathsheba out of his mind. And so then he says the words, go and get her. Because something was burned in his heart that he could not get rid of. Something was burned in his mind and his heart. And he said, I, I just can't get rid of it. And in his mind, he was playing out the scenarios. I'm not going to get graphic, but come on. He, just, you, he was playing out the scenarios in his mind of what could happen, what could be, if he could just have her over to the palace. What could possibly go on? And he finally came in to what was burning in his heart and what was burning in his mind. And so... As she was summoned to the palace. And the Bible says that he lays with her, knowing that she is a married woman. He lays with her. She ends up conceiving a child, knowing that she is pregnant now. What does David do? He sent Uriah to the forefront of the hottest battle, and Uriah dies. His plan was to have this dude murdered to cover up his sin. The Nathan, the prophet, goes to David and tells him a parable about sheep and slaughtering one and giving to another. I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're running out of time. And David said so angry about this parable. He says, the one that did that, he should die and give back everything and all this stuff. And Nathan tells David, he says, you are that man. You committed this sin. And now the blood is upon your hands and you're going to lose your child. David hears the words of Nathan the prophet. And Brother Titus started reading this in Psalms chapter number 51. A beautiful, beautiful psalm of repentance. But in Psalm 51 and verse number 10, David realized something. He says this, Creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David realized there was something wrong with my heart. 
I had a heart condition. And I gave myself to lust. You know it when she was married. No, I was, but I thought about it and it dwelt in me and I couldn't shake it. I couldn't get rid of it. And so he gave in to the sin. David said, I've got something wrong with my heart. I didn't have my affections on things of love, but I had my affections on things of this world. I had my affections on fleshly things, and I fulfilled the lust of my flesh. But the wages of sin is death. David said, I'm going to get this heart condition taken care of. I'm going to die. If I don't let get this heart condition taken care of, I'm not going to be the person or the king that you want me to be. And so David, upon weeping and seeking the face of God and repenting, he says, well, you're creating me a clean heart. In other words, I know that I've become dirty. I know my thoughts have been, become dirty. I know that I haven't done all that's right. But God, I need a heart transplant today. I need you to come in and, and change my heart. I need you to beat after you and not after things of this world. I want out of my mouth. I want to be judged by what comes out of my mouth. If it's for So create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I want to think about positive things. I don't want to be overcome with worldly things and my job and finances and money and the relationships and all this. I want to be focused on you. And I want to be focused on your character and your principles and your commandments and the authority that we have. I want to be focused on prayer and of fasting and reading the word of God. I want that to drive me. I want that to motivate me. I want that's my desire. That's my purpose. That is what I am searching for in this life. Because remember, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, a surplus, that's what comes out of your mouth. Because eventually you can't contain it in your heart. It comes out of your mouth. It's like we eat so much, and you ever said, if I eat in the bottom, I'll throw it up. Yeah, it's, it's abundance. Lucky, really, but it's abundance of your stomach. We just keep shoving food down our throats. Spiritually, whatever we keep shoving down is eventually going to come back. And if we're always shutting down things of the world, things of just emotional problems and stress, if we just keep shutting that stuff down, and then it's all we're going to be talking about. It's all it's going to consume. It's all it's going to consume us. But if we can consume the things of God, if we can eat the Word of God, if we can drink and have the rivers of living water flow out of us, that's what the abundance I want out of me. And I want rivers of living water. If you have the Holy Ghost, we should be so full of God that it just bursts forth out of us. We should be so full of God that it just hurt. We can't contain this thing. It just bursts forth out of us. So when we're at our job, we can't contain it, but we're going to talk about Jesus. Or somebody needs prayer, they're there. Somebody's got cancer, they've got this wrong. And we can't keep that inside of us, but we can say, let me tell you what's in my heart. I believe that God can heal you. And I let me tell you what God's been doing in our church and with the people that we've been praying for. How they're all and heart conditions have been healed and cancer has been healed. We have, we'll let that come out of our mouth. Let me tell you about Jesus. I want to be so full of Jesus that it just comes out. People that said, I'm alone, I would say, no, you're never alone because Jesus, he said he never leave us, he never forsake us. I'm talking about, I, I, I just want to burst for out. Rivers of living water, would you stand with us here today? Amen. This morning, I want you just to take an account of our hearts, an account of our minds. Be mindful of the environments that we're putting ourselves into. Is it affecting our heart? Be mindful of what we think about ourselves because it affects our heart. It affects our heart condition. And then how you think about yourself will determine how you minister. If you witness, if you pray, if you read the Word of God, it's all how you determine it in yourself. Amen. There are times I get discouraged and times that I let that stuff get on me. It doesn't make me want to read. It doesn't make me want to pray. It doesn't make me want to go to church. Amen. But I realize that I've got to go. I've got to set my affections on things above. Amen. Not on things of this earth. Would you lift your hands in this place? Amen. Would you begin to pray with us? We love you, Jesus. Help us, God, to have a heart transplant this morning. God, come into our hearts. There's anything that's not beating correctly. If some of the arteries are getting clogged, if, if the blood supply is flowing how it should in our lives and our minds, I pray, God, let our emotions, the seat of our emotions, our desire, God, let it all be pure. Let it all be holy. Hallelujah. God, I pray, cleanse our minds right now. Hallelujah. Cleanse the fountain of the seat of our thoughts. Cleanse our passion. Cleanse our desires. Cleanse our appetites. God, I want to be hungry for the fruit of the Spirit. I want to be hungry for the things of God. I want the spiritual man to be fed. Amen. God, help me to stop being in the natural with all this materialistic stuff and all this stuff that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. But God, let me set my 
even on spiritual things. Hallelujah, my affections, my purpose, my endeavors. Let it all be set upon you. Hallelujah, let it change our heart. In the name of Jesus, give us a heart transplant. Search my thoughts and try my heart and see if there be any wickedness in me. If there is God, remove it in the name of Jesus. Remove it right now. Hallelujah. I bind all depression in Jesus' name. I bind all discouragement in Jesus' name. I bind all the self-confidence issues in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I pray, God, let them realize who they are to today. Let them realize the power that's in them. Let them realize that they are not a failure. Let them realize that if you gave them a gift and the ministry and the talent they have, that they can and use it and will use it for the glory of God. Amen. Help us to quit judging ourselves, but God, to lift each other up, to pray for one another, that we might be healed. Help our hearts this morning. How we think about ourselves, the environments that we're in, and what we allow into ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. Amen. We have to use the rest of the time to drink these so quickly. And then we'll start our next service here in just a moment.